Hey guys, Dan here from the sounds team at multitracks.com and last week we had the chance to hang out with Pete James and discuss everything from how Hillsong United started to how he created his latest ambient pad release, Starlight, and basically just had a chance to nerd out on all of his favourite analogue gear and take a deep dive into how he currently runs keys at Hillsong Church. So for those of you who don't already know Pete, Pete is a keyboard player, he's a producer, he's a sound designer, a writer, a composer, and a session musician, and he's contributed to over 45 of Hillsong's albums, as well as countless numbers of artists and productions outside of that too. Some of his sound design has been known to pop up on Netflix and HBO series like The Walking Dead, Good Girls, and a load of others as well. So he's made a bunch of his patches available at multitracks.com throughout his entire career. So if you want access to those same tools, head over to the website and, yeah, just check out some of the uh, synths and sampled instruments that Pete has made available that he used in those incredible um, albums in the past. So before we jump into the Hangout, we just really want to welcome you guys here into the chat by offering you a discount off Pete's latest... um, ambient pad release which is called starlight just head to the website click purchase and when you're at the checkout use the code starlight 2021 and you'll get a 20 percent discount the code is only active for two weeks though so get there quick and um yeah take advantage of this great introductory offer so let's jump straight in with the interview from last week peter hello mate how are you thank you good good how are you yeah, good, thank you. Looking forward to this. Uh, yeah, awesome. Looking forward to nerding out. Any chance we get to just talk about keys and main stage templates, ambient pads, all that stuff is good. But um, I'd love to know a little bit more about you and also how you kind of got plugged in doing what you do now. So, yeah, why don't you kick us off and just give us a bit of your kind of musical history and how you came to be doing what you do now? Yeah, 100%. Um, so my parents figured out that I was into music at a young age. So they got me into music, I think I started getting lessons when I was five years old. So I've been doing it basically all my life. Um, Always loved music from a young age. And yeah, like I said, parents picked up on that and just kept feeding that, got me keyboards and just let me do my thing. Um, I only really got into sound designing when I came to Hillsong, actually. Um, So I came to Hillsong in 2000, which is 20, 21 years ago. Um, and then just started serving at youth and everything. And then eventually just started being involved more and more with Hillsong Worship and Hillsong United and that whole thing took off. So it actually, it all started with youth. So you didn't just like jump in straight away to playing keys at Hillsong. I came over for Hillsong College. Um, so I did two years of Hillsong College. Um, actually, I, I first started off, um, doing choir and I was actually, in the choir doing overdubs for albums. That was my first experience with doing a Hillsong album. <clears throat> it wasn't actually me playing keys, it was choir. So I just, yeah, I just did whatever they needed at the time and just, you know, start off in choir and then started playing keys in youth. Um, and then, yeah, things just started. It's, it's funny because United is actually the name of the nights that we would do, we would bring all the age groups together and we would call it a United Night. Um, and that was basically out of our youth group bringing in the all the different age groups together and that was our, yeah, United Night and that's how the United Band actually started. It wasn't some crazy thing like, oh, let's create this Christian worship band, let's call it United. It was literally an extension of our um, youth ministry and that's how it all came to be. So... Yeah. That is wild, man. I love that so much. So the albums kind of presented themselves and the whole thing grew organically. That, that's the funny thing because it, it was always focused on our local local team, our local kids and, you know, creating and creating sounds and songs for our local ministry. And it just happened um, that other people wanted to hear what we were doing in Australia and then it all kind of, yeah. So we never went out to go, hey, let's create a worship band called United and let's tour the world and let's release songs. It was never about that. It's just crazy how it all happened and how it all, yeah, how popular it did become because that's what it, it wasn't about that and it still isn't about that, but yeah. Our recordings were actually our United Nights where we'd join all our youth group together, we would hit record and record X amount of songs that we had and that was our first United albums. Um, and then... 
as things progressed. Um, first, it started with United. Then, as United got older, <clears throat> that's where Young and Free got bought in because we realised, wait, because United, United was Young and Free. <laughs> because that's what it started. And then, obviously, we got older, and the young kids were like, "Oh, we need to give them something to, you know, you know, shoot for as well." So that's when uh, Young and Free came out. Um, and a lot of the United stuff filtered through into our main church stuff as well. So you'd hear on the early albums, um, a lot of our United songs were being re-recorded with Hillsong Worship. Way, way, way back when we started defining, okay, we've got three different groups, we need to define what these are and what the sounds are, but yeah. That's so cool. I love hearing about how these things develop. It's like there's a need and you adapt to the need instead of being really conscious about, hey, this is what we're going to do and we're going to aim to do this. And yep. obviously there's always an element of that, but mm -hmm. I love that exploration and just serving what's what's needed around you. That's so cool to hear, mate. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. I guess that makes me think now, when did sound design come into all this? Have you always been building your own sounds and playing them at church or is that something that happened later so on? sound design, I guess it came out of the a necessity to have specific sounds. Like back then I had Omnisphere um, and that was what we used on a lot of our earlier Hillsong albums. We still use it on current ones, um, but back then 99% um, of all the um, the keyboard sounds were from Omnisphere. And I still remember doing um, Zion. You remember that United album? Yeah. Uh, one of my favourites. It's got obviously Oceans and some of those songs on it. Um, and Joel giving us references and saying, okay, so this album we want it to sound a lot like and gave us a bunch of references, M83, Passion Pit, oh, I love it. Radiohead, et cetera, et cetera. And so we would go away and go, okay, and well, me as a keyboard sound designer, I'd be like, okay, listening to this album over and over again, these albums and going, okay, I need to produce th uh, those, like M83, if you know M83, it's very 80s based analog synth, so I would go into Omnisphere and, you know, start picking the sounds which are closest to the um, albums that I was listening to, and then I will start tweaking them and making them usable for specific songs that we're doing. So, yeah, it came from listening to albums, wanting those sounds off the albums and copying, and then along the way you go like, oh, let's try this and let's, what if I did this and what if I did that, and you start getting into the whole world of sound designing and experimenting and that's how it all kind of took off that's so, so cool so l much like the hillsong project that you mentioned earlier you never kind of just sat down and went i'm going to be a sound designer that's what i'm going to do you kind of you just built what you needed and it served um what was going on around you and served that ministry that's that's amazing i really really love that and all these tools that you've made you you've made them available on multitracks.com throughout your entire career and I just, I'm curious to know if you've got like a favorite pack or something that you've made and sampled and released that you're really proud of or something that you use regularly. My most recent one, um, Analog Multi, um, is my favorite because I'm using it every week at Hillsong Church. Um, obviously, taking my analog gear to church isn't always practical. We use a lot of analog gear um, in the studio to record um, albums, but we hardly ever take them on tour. Um, there's a few reasons why. Um, analog gear can be very temperamental. It can go out of tune. Um, if the temperature changes in a room, it'll change the pitch of your analog keyboard. The newer ones um, go out of tune less, but they still go out of tune. And you've got to calibrate them to match the temperature in the room. So little things like that. Um, you don't want to have to be tuning it in, be in between songs or anything like that. The other thing, for example, I've got the Prophet 5. You can probably see it if I... It's the bottom keyboard there. Um, it's such a nice keyboard, but it's a mono keyboard. It's not even stereo. And our ears are so used to hearing stereo that hearing mono is a little bit underwhelming, I guess. <laughs> um, and so I was like, okay, I'm going to sample every note and every sound twice. So I actually was able to make stereo versions of what would otherwise be a mono keyboard. The Prophet 5's only got five note polyphony. So... If you're using the actual analog keyboard, you can't play more than five notes at a time. Whereas a lot of us keyboardists, you might have, want to have, you know, four notes in the top hand and an octave yeah. in the bass, and then you've already gone uh -huh. over your quota. So for you, the the analog versus digital argument is less about which sounds better uh, and more about which is more appropriate for the environment that you're in or the situation that you're in. It's kind of more about practicality. They both have benefits, yeah. <clears throat> have you got any... 
examples with you there that you can show us of yeah. some of your patches or some of the templates and stuff that you currently use? Yeah, so I've just got my um, main stage. Let me go to it here. Um, I've got my main stage template from the weekend. Um, you can see our set list in the middle. I always use that as a cheat sheet if I'm learning new songs too. Um, I'm sure a bunch of other people do the same thing. Um, <clears throat> so I only use two sounds actually on the weekend, um, the analog multi, um, and then I added to the analog multi um, the P5 drive mix, which is from my Pro5 collection. Um, so for this first song, we did See the Light, so I used the P5 drive mix. I'll just quickly play what I did for that. So... <laughs> So that was the lead sound that I used for the first song. And then everything else, I used this analog multi and the P5 drive mix. And basically, it's a stack of all these sounds. Um, it's got the drive mix in there. Um, it's got a bright profit pad. It's got a warm profit pad. It's got um, Big Sky versions of that. We've got OB6 um, samples in there. I've got lead sounds in there. Um, and like I said, we've got this vintage knob, which I can add more or less random pitch variation. So it sounds very chorusy and analog if I want it to be. I'll show you kind of, I've got everything low pass filter mapped to the mod wheel. So I can start off with, let's say the P5 drive mix. And then I can add um, another Prophet 5 sound. And then add an OB6 sound. and then add um, the leads on top of it. And I can bring in different elements. I've even got the Big Sky um, versions of it separate. So if you want a really ambient, beautiful pad, but you don't want it so harsh, you can just use that. It might be clicking and popping because we're recording a lot of stuff, but you get the general idea. Um, and that's basically my main go-to um, multi. It's got, like you heard, lead sounds. You can use them separate or together and Profit and Big Sky and OB6 and everything all kind of mixed into this one thing. So I can really transition in and create something really big and bright or um, quiet and warm and intimate just with that one patch. So. Um, another sound which I've been using a lot uh, recently, especially for Young and Free songs, for an effect. Um, um, and I've even used it on uh, like the new United sound uh, song. I was experimenting using that um, as well. But this is a really long sample. I decided to do, I think it was 8 to 10 seconds. It might have even been 12 seconds because I wanted to capture the analog low-pass filter. Um, but anyway, I'll show you the sound. Um, and this is at the P5 Res Filter Suite. And a lot of the times I'll just do an octave in the key that I'm doing to just, just transition into a section or out of a section. But yeah, that's another sound that I oh, really like. shivers, mate, honestly. I just want to go grab my keyboard now and just play for the rest of this Hangout <laughs> volume. <laughs> you don't just create patch bundles, though. Uh, you also make ambient pads. And your latest release, Starlight, uh, why do, well, why don't you just tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, because sometimes you don't want just a static ambient pad that sounds the same the whole way through. You want to be able to customize it and manipulate it and bring in and out different elements depending on um, the dynamic of a song or the mood of a transition or whatever. So with them all being separated, you can create that mood really easily and really customize it's, I mean, it um, to how you want It's such sound. a unique sounding pad that I can't help but wonder... Did you sit down and just think, yep, yeah, now I'm going to make something that sounds fluttery and heavenly? Oh, well, based on everything you said before, probably not. But. Yeah, 100%. So everything that I throw up on multi-tracks is not 
it's n- most of the time I'm not just going, oh, let's just create a product so I can put on multi-tracks. It all comes from either what I've done at Hillsong, um, the sounds that I've put on uh, you know, Hillsong United or Hillsong Worship albums or even um, other worship projects that I've done. Um, and so that's exactly what happened with Starlight. So I, me and Nigel actually, Nigel Hendroff, you probably know, guitarist from Hillsong, we went over to um, South Korea recently and did, a, well, before the pandemic hit, um, and we did um, training in their churches and ministry and um, made some really good connections. Um, one of the guys over there asked me if I wanted to program up all the synths and keys for his worship song. And so I got back to Australia, um, he sent me the stems and I created, um, obviously, all the parts and stuff for that song. Um, but in the middle of it, I there was this down section. I wanted to create something really ambient. <clears throat> um, and that's where the Starlight ambient pad idea came from. Um, I used a piano, mixed in a whole lot of different reverbs and delays and um, different modular things um, and created this ambience for the middle section of the song. And I loved it so much. It was kind of my favorite element that, I, like I said, I was exploring and I just stumbled across this ambient a texture and I loved it so much that I'm like, man, I need to chuck this up on multitrack. So what I did is I took that ambient pad that I'd used on this project and um, with playback and the ability to actually do multi-layered ambient pads. Now you don't, you can't just, you don't have to just use one um, audio file. You can actually do multi-layers. So what I did is with the piano as a bass, I built all these other um complementing sounds and textures that work really well with initial ambient pads. So you've got in there, um, obviously, the ambient pad. You've got a reverse bells um, that I actually created for Omnisphere um, when I was on the beta testing team for Omnisphere 2. Um, and that sound that you hear, the reverse bells, is actually, I've heard it on so many different TV um programs and movies and everything like I've heard it on The Walking Dead, The Purge, The Bachelorette, The um, Bachelor, um, Good Girls, like I've heard it on all these different things. I'm like, it's been so popular in the secular world. I'm like, let's add this to my ambient pad. And so I've put that in there. Um, I've got um, a pizzicato reverbed out string layer, which is kind of panning left and right. Um, And on top of that, I actually contacted a good friend of mine, Jason Schofer, um, because he creates really amazing field recordings. And he um, recorded um, rain ambience. And I'm like, I love that, like the whole idea of soundscape using real environments to create a mood. Um, And so from his dystopian rains, Omnisphere Library, I used a rain layer and I I EQ'd it, I put some reverb on it, kind of made it a little bit more ambient. And that's a layer that um, you can bring in and out um, with it. And I think that was one of my, yeah, like I said, exploring, trying new things. Um, And I love that kind of ambient layer. Even if you can't tell it's rain, it just gives you this kind of emotional, yeah, I don't know how to explain it, but it it gives us environmental feeling. Um, Everyone loves rain when you're falling asleep and, you know, the sound of rain. I love it. Like, so I'm like, why can't I put this in an ambient pad? So I did that. Um, Also, um, what was the other layer? A double bass, real low double bass, reverbed out double bass. Um, Yeah. And that's Starlight. Now, uh, all these, mixing all these elements in together to make one ambient pad. Oh, I love it. Look, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so why don't we just use this chance to get real nerdy. Um, I can see a couple of keyboards just to the side there. Have you got any, like, are they your go-to bits of gear? Just talk to us a little bit about your your Yeah, cool. Um, Obviously, I'm loving my analog synths. I'll quickly turn this around so you can see. Actually, you might be able to see one. Yeah, it's hiding in the background. So I've got a um, Moog Sub 37 in the background, which I actually used the other day on uh, one of my wife's songs just for a really low sub sine wave bass. Um, Then we go over here. You can see my Prophet 5 on the bottom and the OB6. Um, I'm going to keep going around a little bit more. You'll see the preamps that I actually sampled them all through. These are classic API pre's. if you're aware, um, API got bought out by an- another company. Um, I don't know when that was, but 
Um, they obviously change the internal um, design and what they used for them. And so these are classics. So when you're talking about analog gear, um, back in the day, all your 80s since they wouldn't have been tracked through the new APIs because they weren't around. Um, they would have been tracked through these classic API pre's and they're a lot dirtier, they're a lot, um, I don't know, they've got a lot more character than the new new API pre's, which are very clean. And so I loved partnering these up with the classic gear that they would have been run through for all your um, old school recordings back in the day. So I love those pre's, some of my favourites, especially with the vocal mics. Um, that's my mic that I use as well. Love it through the classic API pre's. It's basically Telefunken 251. Um, it's a different shell, um, but the guts, because um, I got it off a friend, he changed the guts of it to be a uh, 251. So very pop mic, probably 80% of all uh, the pop stuff you're hearing or stuff on Spotify is a 251 style mic. So she's doing pop, so that's why I've got that. Um, partnered with the classic API pre's, it just sounds yeah amazing. So it's funny because back in the day when I didn't have analog gear, um, I would go to specific sounds. I didn't even know that I was. And it's funny because one of the first pads I ever loved playing was an Obi pad, but it was a sample of an Obi. So it's funny how my ear gravitated towards the OB6 sound before I even touched an analog OB6. Um, and the same with the Prophet um, as well. Um, the main pad sound from Oceans is actually a sample of a Prophet 5. Um, and so that's why I grabbed those two because I've already fallen in love with the sound. Um, and then obviously with the, the Prophet 5 keyboard, I replicated the Omnisphere um, Prophet 5 sound that we used on Oceans and did a full, um, yeah, I think a few gig sample of the Oceans pad. And then with the OB6, um, yeah, I love it. It's it's so gritty. They're completely different tones, but they partner really well together. So I often use them in tandem because they bring um, something different. The OB6 is great for all your ARPs and your um, aggressive basses and um, aggressive pads. And the OB and the Prophet's a little bit sweeter, I think, for pads. Um, completely different tones, but they partner really well together. And that's why pick those two and uh, so thanks. Yeah. Sample, um, them, yeah. Honestly, thank you so much for hanging out, mate. This has been so fun. No worries. Um, let's do it again sometime and we'll dig a little bit deeper into some into some other topics. But yeah, Pete, thanks for coming. And My pleasure. Yeah, we'll see you soon. 100%. Bye, mate. Cool. Cheers. <laughs>